I um, would like to welcome you to a very special moment, something that uh, means a lot to me actually. But um, Sir Nicholas Sirota, I know he doesn't like saying that, but in the Netherlands it means a lot, uh, has, uh, has, uh, <laughs> has decided <laughs> to, um, uh, has done us the honour of coming here and uh, saying a few words um, about this museum and about the situation of museums in, in general. I think if, if the Van Abbe Museum is a four-belt functie for um, a Nederland, then Nick is a four-belt functie for me, and it's good that he doesn't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he was actually also responsible for inviting me to do one of the first uh, uh, exhibitions that I did. I can't say international because it was a Tate Triennale of British art, but one of the first exhibitions that I did outside of Scotland um, long ago in 1998, I think, he first invited me. The exhibition was in 2000. Um, so uh, I've always been, been grateful and also impressed. Uh, Nick, of course, uh, is the director of Tate in London, um, which uh, used to be Tate Gallery. Um, and when he took over, had a, an institution in, in London on Millbank and uh, an idea that there might be something happening in Liverpool. Um, and now, of course, it's one of the most important and established and famous galleries in the world, um, with not only the Tate on Millbank, but also Tate Modern, also Tate Liverpool, also Tate St. Ives, and also Tate National, which actually uh, addresses the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, it's of course internationally extremely famous and I think that's uh, down to, I'm sure, the efforts of many, many people. Um, but um, for Al, uh, Nick Sirota and his uh, incredible development of that institution to something which I think could never have been imagined when he first took over. Um, so Nick, it's with real great pleasure that I'd like to invite you to come to the stage. Charles, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think I'm here as an outsider, but those of you who know me know that actually, as far as the Van Adler Museum is concerned, I'm something of an insider, because I think I could say that Charles mentioned five legendary directors who've served here since 1947, and in a way my life has been touched by all five in different ways. And I've known four of them. I didn't know Jean Leering, but my story in a way begins with Jean Leering because I first became of the Van Abbe Museum, or aware of the Van Abbe Museum in 1970, when I visited the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London and saw the Don Judd exhibition. He later became Donald Judd. <laughs> Rather as Nick Sorota later became N Nicholas Sorota. Um, but I saw that show and seeing that exhibition and seeing the artist at work in a space as Judd was at that moment had a powerful influence on me and it propelled me towards working uh, where I work today. Um, I also became aware of Jean Leering being at that moment, at least in the earliest part of the 70s, more engaged with the avant-garde which as Charles also said was to do with the history of the institution although later in the 70s, of course, he moved in a different and very important direction. Again, Charles mentioned it earlier. And I saw, for instance, the Bruce Nauman exhibition that was here in 1973. Um, and it was, but it was in 75 that I first became really more closely involved, thanks largely to an Anglophile new director sitting just here, <laughs> Rudy Fuchs, who came to Oxford and we talked. I was then at the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford and we talked about the possibility of collaboration. And our first collaboration was on a show of an artist who was seen only in commercial galleries in London at that time, only one gallery, uh, Alan Charlton. That was the first show that we made together. And subsequently, when I went to the <coughs> Whitechapel, five or six years after I'd first seen the Donald Judd show, uh, Rudy and I have made a number of exhibitions together, mainly, I have to say, coming from Eindhoven to London. Um, Janis Kuneris, um, Gerhard Richter, uh, Arnold Reiner, Gilbert and George, Gunter Bruce, I think that went the other way, but I can't remember exactly. It didn't matter. The main point really was that there was a d dialogue and a discussion and a sense of collegiality between these institutions 
and while it may seem quite conventional in a way for exhibitions to travel in that in this way at that time it was much less so there were small circuits of exhibitions that traveled but fundamentally if you were working in such an institution whether it was in the netherlands rather less but certainly in the uk you were very much on your own and so to have a friend in that way made a difference then i of course came to know Jan Dierbaut, well, partly originally as uh, Rudis co-conspirator, but then later in his own right um, as director here. And as many of you know, when he left here, he came and worked at the Tate for a number of years, working particularly on the collection where he left his mark. And I might say something about that uh, in a moment. And then Charles has, of course, referred to the fact that in 1998, we invited him long before he came here to be uh, the selector of the, of the first Tate Triennial. So I've been very conscious of the Stelic Van Allen Museum here in Eindhoven for many, many years. And I've had a huge regard for what it has done um, over that four, effectively 40 year period. And I came to know more about its history before really, before Jean Lering, when I got to know Eddie de Wilder in the 1980s, by which time, of course, he was well established, more than well established, he was controlling, dominating, leading <laughs> the, uh, the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. And I had the pleasure of working with him on a number of exhibitions. And Eddie um, spoke always about the difficulties of being on your own in a small town and having to fight um, for art. And in a way, I think that's really what I want to talk about today, because it's really that process of bringing new things into the world, acting in a way as a midwife, but also as a co collaborator that distinguishes the, the great museums of contemporary art. I mean, if I want to think about what have I learned from the Van Allen Museum as an institution, um, I think it's, first of all, to say, actually, and most importantly, at a moment when everyone is looking back for 75 years, that history itself is not enough. History is very important, but you have to live in the present and you have to think about the future. And when you think about the future, there are a small number of principles, I think, that need to guide any institution of this kind. And the first is self-evident when you walk through all the rooms of the current displays. And the first, it is that you have to work very closely with artists. What's striking about so many of the acquisitions in this museum has been the fact that they've been made immediately after or during or sometimes before an exhibition. Usually paid for long after. <laughs> I'm looking at Rudy now, because I know he's a, <laughs> I know he was a good pair. <laughs> but that moment of working with the artist, or with a collective, is the moment when minds come together and opportunities grow for building a collection. And it's that moment where, through artists, one understands what it is that is important about the moment. And it's that discourse and discussion with the artists that gives rise to the kind of programme you see today or the programme that you've seen here for the last uh, 40 years. The role of the museum, in a way, is to sustain artists. Not uncritically, in fact, very deliberately so, but it's to publish their work. It's to make that work familiar and to become part of the discourse to the point at which you can walk upstairs into the old building and you can see the voice installation or you can go in and look at the Richard Long and these look like old familiar friends. Um, and one wonders how they could ever have been difficult, shocking, um, not part of the culture. 
because they've changed the culture. And it is bringing that work into the collection and making it available and having it on view, not coming and going, but remaining, that becomes really the function, the virtue, in a way, of a museum rather than a Kunstsammer. It is that essential part of the, the collection from which so much grows. When you go upstairs and you look at the Jan de Kreiser room, and then you think, for instance, what Jan de Bart acquired when he bought in the mid 1980s, in, into, or the late 80s and into the 90s, you know, the, the Schutter, the Bustamont, these things aren't on here at the moment, but they often are here, the Munoz, um, Rachel Whitreed, um, Miroslav Balka, these were all really important acquisitions. And the fact that they are here now is due to that connection with the artists. Charles spoke earlier about the issue of internationalism. And one of the things that Eddie talked to me about was the struggles that he'd had in the early 50s in trying to persuade the city and those around him that to be international in Eindhoven was, it, was important. In his terms, it was principally making sure that, that those great artists who he had admired and many of whom he knew in the 19, late 40s and early 50s, working mainly in Paris, but also some in the Netherlands, came into the collection. When he went to Amsterdam, of course, it became more American focused. Rudy, of course, opened up the North and welcomed the South. He brought the Mediterranean and the Latin and the, and the Latin sensibility into juxtaposition with the North and made some really memorable exhibitions with Cunellas and others. Now, of course, to look only at Europe or only at America, again, as Charles mentioned earlier, is <coughs> in a, insufficient. The world has changed so dramatically that in, in an institution which only looks in its immediate continent has to be regarded as rather parochial just as an institution which only looked at its own town or its own country 50 years ago would have been parochial. And so that obligation to look wider is always an important, has become a very important, it's always been there, but the form in which it, take, it takes has obviously changed quite dramatically. What I think has also changed in the last 40 years is that whereas these separate institutions used to be in a certain sense citadels led very often by one person working with three others communicating their own vision maybe in collaboration with artists now institutions such as this can only really prosper if they work in partnership with others and i mean not just other museums but also with the universities with other places of further education with individuals who work in other disciplines and it's significant that I am to be followed tonight not by another artist or a museum director but by a writer. Working in that way is an essential part for all these institutions because what I think finally I want to say is that where Eddie de Wilder Rudy, Jean Leering, Jan de Bart, and now Charles have really distinguished or helped to help create a sense of distinction for the Van Aver Museum is that it has always treated its audience with huge respect. It's never been overtly populist. It's never gone for the big names. It's always tried to take a difficult path. And it's done so in a way which some people would regard at certain times as being too remote, too arrogant even. But frankly, that's necessary sometimes. We shouldn't be afraid of pursuing an intellectual discipline simply because not everyone can appreciate at the moment that one is communicating. 
And yet, as I look around, not just in the Netherlands, but also, I know, very much in England, this kind of approach is under attack, and we have to resist. We have to resist, but we have to resist intelligently. Not simply to say that the museum has to withdraw into a citadel. It has to be an institution which has a dialogue with its audience, which engages with its audience, which obliges its audience to come back and talk to us, whether that audience be a flaneur or a pilgrim or a tourist, so that that audience is obliged to respond and become an active rather than a passive audience. Because at the end of the day, these institutions will only survive if they are active and not passive. And the reason why the Stelic Van Allen Museum in Eindhoven has survived is that it has always been a force for resistance, or a force for, a force for opening up new territory. And to have achieved all that in 75 years is more than most people make in a lifetime. <laughs> there isn't an institution in the United Kingdom that can match this institution. There are you know, grand, big institutions such as the Tate. But if you look across the country, there isn't another, there isn't a, there isn't a museum. Maybe the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art aspires in the same direction, or maybe it should have the ambition to aspire in the same direction, and then it might not have lost Charles Escher <laughs> from Scotland. But seriously, you should cherish what you have here. And I do, at 75, want to congratulate everyone in this city for having sustained the institution in the way that they have through the good times and the bad times, and has given it this platform from which I'm sure that in 75 years' time, not many of us will be here, but it will probably, I hope, look as though the 75th birthday was just half time, and in the second half, there was all to play for. Thank you. Thank you.